Welcome to the Museum of the Moving Image here in Astoria, Queens, located in the historic Kaufman Studios. And this is one of my favorite museums in all of New York City. Probably one of the favorite museums I've ever been to in my life. And here we're starting at the Jim Henson exhibition, which of course is famous for Sesame Street and movies like Labyrinth, Never Ending Story, so many others. So let's check it out. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanus, and let me know where you're watching from here at the Museum of a Moving Image. It's nearby many trains, such as the R train, also nearby the F train, and um, many other buses you can catch over here. It is very easily accessible. Right now, admission for adults is $15. So here we see all the different puppets made by the legendary Jim Henson, who's probably one of the most famous puppeteers in modern history. Or puppet makers, to be more specific. So he created a lot of these looks of these characters. <laughs> this appears to be Gonzo's <laughs> family member. So I love this museum. I'm first time I came here was when I was maybe 11 years old, maybe a little bit younger, 9, 10 years old or so, and it blew me away, really blew me away. I loved coming here multiple times, over and over and over again, and uh, I came here during a school trip, I came here when it was remodeled, uh, like 15 years ago, and I just uh, am obsessed with it, so I'm so glad to be showing it to you finally for the first time. So here we have Kermit the Frog. Look at this. The legendary Kermit from the Muppets. And Jim Henson right over here. And here is uh, one of the gadgets he used, which is the microphone headband. True master. This is him on the set of the Muppets movie. So today we're going to just walk around this museum, show you all the stuff in details, take our sweet time for a long, unedited video through the Museum of Moving Image, or MoMai for short. Henson's family bought their first television here at a major expense at the time when he was just a young teenager. Wow. He especially enjoyed the comedian Ernie Kovacs' humor and inventive... Uh, approach to performing for television. Look how tiny that TV is. Wow. This for captions, but it's not working. In nineteen fifty five, Sam and Friends. Jim Henson and fellow University of Maryland student Jane Nibble created Sam and Friends, a five-minute show that aired live on Washington, D.C.'s WRC-TV. Mm, cool. Here's another one, the Steve Allen Show, 1956. Wow, he got his start very early. Henson performed this sketch of Kermit being menaced by Yor Yorick on Sam and Friends, which is uh, this, this guy over here, <laughs> very creepy. Oh, I 
remember reading these TV Guide back in the 90s. So this is the character of Ralph, and Ralph was built in 1962 for the Purina dog chow commercials in the 1960s, and he was the comic sidekick in the Jimmy Dean show. Interesting. It was one of my favorite Muppets. I even used to have one of those teddy bears. Oh my god, is this what I think it is? An early version of Bert and Ernie? Nope. Prime Minister Puppet. Experimental, so he directed this as well. Very no, experimental for his time. And here we have arrived, Sesame Street, which is filmed right next door at Kaufman Studios. Now uh, I think HBO owns Sesame Street. Thank you. 
I love these guys, the two snarky critics, Waldorf and Sat Statler. So Muppet Show ran from 1976 to 1981 originally. Of course, it has come back on and off since then. And it was a variety show, if you don't remember, of all the different Muppets. And they would have a guest star and everything. Here's a Swedish chef. <laughs> Which is a, a very, very, uh, very stereotype of a Swede. Apparently not accurate. I met various Swedes since then. They told me it's completely inaccurate. The Zoot Puppet. And the famous Miss Piggy, designed by Bonnie Erickson. It was built by Jim Henson, but was performed by Frank Oz. Frank Oz ended up being another very famous puppeteer. He also did Yoda as well, and his voice. Your letters from fans of The Muppet Show. I'm 
So this is Fraggle Rock, 1987. I don't remember the show. I've never seen it, I think. The Gordons of Fraggle Rock are a remarkable combination of puppetry, mime, and technological wizardry. They're among the most sophisticated puppets we've ever created. We needed giant characters who had complete freedom of movement at the same time expressive faces. We needed to find a way to allow two performers to control the same puppet. Now, suited up, the performer inside will create half of the gorge performance, movements of the arms, legs, and the body. The other half of the performance... <laughs> so cool. Let me know if you remember Fraggle Rock. And here's Labyrinth with the famous David Bowie 1986 feature film with a lot of Muppets. <laughs> Oh, that's really cool. And the costume, oh wow, David Bowie's costume, oh that's awesome. And is this Edinburgh? Oh, interesting. Here's a clip from Labyrinth, can't show it too much. the Jim Henson exhibition that was really cool now let's see the other general movie memorabilia and this is a really cool section oh, I'm excited welcome to old Hollywood So back in the early days of Hollywood, the golden age of Hollywood, they would have these cinemas. And the cinemas will only be a single movie theater, so it won't be a multiplex like we usually go to nowadays. And each of these cinemas had a theme. A lot of them did, all across the U.S. Many of them designed by Thomas Lamb, one of the more famous architects. And here's one that's kind of showing one theme that was used over and over again in many theaters, the Egyptian theme. And you'll find these in New York City today. There's still a few of them left. So let's walk in and then we'll kind of go back and show you more of the exhibition. Oh, so cool. <laughs> and this looks exactly the same as it did when I was a little kid. I can only imagine going back to these cinemas that really felt like an experience, not just seeing the film, but actually going to the place, which I think is, I think is something we lost and we have to bring it back. 
Because now, you know, you can watch a movie at Netflix or on your phone, on YouTube. So I think the movie experience needs to be brought back to this. Eating Tut's Nuts. <laughs> and some pina coladas. Oh, cool. So this is the movie theater. This is his pull here. All right. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> That's really cool. So I really, I wish I can show you more of the movie clips, but if I put it on YouTube, it'll probably be taken down. So let's continue walking around. This makes me want to watch The Mummy again. So that is making me want to watch The Mummy again, which is a movie I really love, one of my favorite films of all time. Ooh, and this is what I find really cool, the old video game exhibition. So before we go there, let me show you this. This is a lot of the old programs from the movie event events. These were called road shows. And we, we actually had a road show a few years ago for the Hateful Eight. Uh, Quentin Tarantino recreated that experience. But basically a road show is that a movie would go from city to city as if it were a touring theater, musical theater production. And it will go from city to city, be in the biggest cinema, and it will come with the program when you come in. And it would be a, a more formal affair. So people would go a little bit better dressed and you would be given these beautiful programs. And I myself went to the one for The Hateful Late by Quentin Tarantino and still have that program. Wow, this one is an old one, Wings. Very old film, one of the first films to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. I think the first film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. Ben-Hur. Salome. Monte Cristo. Oh, we got Rudolf Valentino. Who? was based here in New York City for a big portion of his career. John Barrymore, Don Juan. So as we're looking at these for the silent era, like Rudolph Valentino, it was based here in New York. New York was the original Hollywood. Uh, and silent films were made mostly here. Kaufman Studios, which is one of the buildings we're in right now. Silver Cup Studios nearby, Steiner Studios as well. It was made here, New York, and of course there was a few studios of the big Hollywood companies like MGM had one in Manhattan. But then they moved to LA, mostly by the late 1920s is when it started moving in mass to LA because of the sunny weather. And the need for sound stages. So actually, the need for sound stages was another important factor in deciding to move to LA. Aside from filming, suddenly you can film outside 
which was good for LA. But if you want to film sound, you had to film in a very controlled environment. New York is the worst for sound. And there was not enough space, especially cheap real estate, to build these massive sound stages, which are basically state, uh, sets where you can control all the audio, all the sound environment. LA was the place. Here we have one of the theaters. These theaters, as I mentioned, still exist in New York City. We, you can actually visit the King's Theater in Brooklyn, uh, which is now a venue, but you can still see how it looked like. There was one in in uh, Queen Center Mall right in front of it. Unfortunately, it's like been converted to a church, which is um, cool for the church, but sad for cinema, cinema buffs. I actually saw, it was called Lowe's and Elmwood, and I saw... Uh, 10 Things I Hate About You, among other films at that theater, and it just look, look like, just like this. Village East, Cinema Village East in the East Village also has a similar theater to this. Here's what the lobbies look like. And this one is depicting, I think, the Roxy. Yeah, Roxy Theater, 1988. Uh, Roxy Theater was demolished. And so sad it was demolished. Now, a lot of the Broadway theaters we know and love today actually started as movie theaters before they really became for Broadway. Here's a usher's uniform for Radio City Music Hall, which also was a movie theater for a portion of its history. And ladies and gentlemen, we're at La Dolce Vita. By, directed by Federico Fellini. One of the better movies made from Italy, starring the beautiful Anita Ekber. And now let me show you the video game section over here. So video games have had a long history. Of course, in visual arts, video games is crucial. Often we don't talk enough about video game history. But this is one of the very first video games ever made, The Brown Box which dates back all the way to 1968. It was invented by Ralph H. Baer. And this was supposed to be a television-based video game system. So this is the very first video game console. And before PlayStation, before Nintendo 64, before all the great video game consoles, this was it. And you had left-hand player, right-hand player. Look at the first remote controls. And we actually didn't deviate too much from it. Uh, we had square remote controls only until the Super Nintendo, basically. You have all the key aspects to a video game system. The, the toggles slash... Here, they're knobs, but they turned into toggles later on. Joysticks. We even have the very first joysticks here. Wow. So, of course, this was a video game system for TV, but there was bigger ones that were meant for it to be on its own, its own system, and this is the Space War, made in 1961. Now, this one is not as portable as the brown box. So I guess this is a prototype for the early arcade machine because this might be for, for coins. And here, ladies and gentlemen, we have computer space. I don't know too much about this game, but we have Pong. So here we have all the famous uh, video game systems. Look at that. Donkey Kong, Saxon, and let me see. Mm -mm. 
All right. Let's try uh, Mortal Kombat. Hard to set up uh, the camera. So it's hard to set up the camera, so I guess I'm going one handed for this game. Raiden, my favorite. Let's do it. All right, let's do this. Okay, so that was Gauntlet, and Gauntlet, I can see how Diablo ended up getting its inspiration. I don't know what Diablo is, it's a type of game similar where it's called an RPG, or this in this case is an action RPG. And here we have the famous Donkey Kong. Let's try it out. This is one of the very first games that made Nintendo, that used to be a trading card company, dating back more than 100 years. They end up going to the video game business and wanted to make a game about King Kong, but they couldn't get the rights, so they made it Donkey Kong. And this is one of the very first versions of Mario and also Princess Peach to be featured. And look how old this is. This is one of the originals. Oh, 
is the control system. And Donkey Kong is actually the villain of this. So you had to... Um, He had to dodge his his um, his barrels. Oh, no, no, ah! <laughs> I have to jump. There's a great documentary about a guy who reached the very last level of Donkey Kong. And it's basically a very glitched out level because they never thought anyone could get that far, the original the game developers. Let's try this one. This one's interesting. This one reminds me of Bust a Move. I don't know too much about this one. Last token. Okay, that was tricky. So that was a whole lot of fun. Um, arcades used to be a gigantic deal. Now a little bit about Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat actually became one of the very first signs of the video game industry dipping before the console era and at home gaming because Mortal Kombat became very popular very quickly in the 80s and the thing is people thought it was way too violent and it was destroying America one senator actually took this all the way up to the highest levels of the US and said that this video game was going to be the death of Western civilization quite bold words so arcades started going downhill, and that's where it gave rise to at-home video game systems such as the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. So here we have all the old memorabilia of uh, TV shows, such as Batman, Julia, Partridge Family.
These cups are so awesome. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. C3PO from Star Wars reclining down and tape between his legs. Okay. A Pez dispenser? Oh my god. Star Wars size. So cool. So Howdy Doody was invented by Frank Paris, and Frank Paris actually lived in one of the most haunted, haunted houses in all of New York City, 12 Gay Street, and that's where he encountered the Phantom. Howdy Doody wasn't haunted. It was uh, the creation of another writer who made the shadow. You can learn more about that. Search for the Phantom of Gay Street. You'll see the video. So these are tabloid magazines, oh my god. Before the age of TMZ, Insta, US Weekly, page six. These were the original. My pinup girls. <laughs> Museum. I love it. Here we have the puppets from Labyrinth by Jim Henson and his company. Actually, never mind, sorry, my mistake. Nah, Labyrinth, but this is the Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. Co-directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz. Oh, that's cool. 1982.
So we're seeing a lot of production design for The Wiz, which is an updated version of The Wizard of Oz filmed here in New York City. And here we have makeup. Uh, the Elephant Man, a movie I've never seen, don't want to see. Uh, but I do like this movie, this Miss Doubtfire. Robin Williams, of course, dressing up as a nanny in order to reconnect with his children. Great, great movie. And here are all the makeup supplies needed for film. So this is The Gaze, 2021, directed by Barry Jenkins. Great director. Always has beautiful cinematography in his movies. Wow, movie and paintings. And here we have the mask, Jim Carrey. Now I'm trying to remember his tagline. I remember he said something along the lines of, ooh, smoking. Something along those lines. And here we have Chewbacca. Uh. <laughs> Aliens from, where is this? From A New Hope. Star Wars. No, this is not Star Wars. Babylon 5. Right here. TV series. Alright. So that was only the first floor. There's more. <laughs> Let's go. Now we get to the temporary exhibitions, and this is deep fake, unstable evidence on screen. So here's different news segments, different life-changing, um, world-changing videos. I remember this one, Loose Change. I was really into this documentary. Released back in 2005, made with a budget of only $2,000. Distributed online for free on Google Video. Got 10 million views on its first year of release. exhibition design. Thank you. 
So deep fakes, if you don't know what they are, is basically making an actor look like another person. And they use footage that an algorithm, artificial intelligence, can predict or um, re-emulate how someone else's face looked. So, for example, they're making, I think, this person look like Marilyn Monroe. They're making this one look like Morgan Freeman, that's for sure. Let's go back in time to the beginning of cinema. Behind the screen. And here we have the very first cameras ever made. This is before cinema itself. So before there was movies, there was optical illusions. And this one is where you roll the wheel and you would see a moving image because of the slits, or here in this case, mirrors. But this one is interesting. This one, uh-uh, how do you do this? I think you have to wind it up. Wind it up all the way. And there we go. It looks like the bird is in the cage. This one is, I think, more interesting. There it is. Hard to focus, but you get the idea. And because of the slits and the lighting and everything makes the optical illusion and the movement makes the optical illusion that's moving. That's really what you're seeing. Here's another one of a running man. Oh, this one's cool. These were called zoetropes. 1834, they were introduced. 
were the first to project films. And the Lumiere brothers, very first films ever made. First movies. In the late 19th century, scientists like French physiologist Etienne Jules Marais used the new invention of photography to record and analyze motion. In 1882, Marais built an open air studio with a large camera that could record the movement of a person walking against a black background. Wow. He built a camera with a slotted disc whose rotation exposes one image and then another. He called it the fixed plate chronophotograph. The camera would combine a series of successive images on a single plate, making it possible to analyze all forms of movement. To Marais, movement was the most important characteristic of human and animal life. His lifelong project was to study the exact nature of movement over time. Over a period of 20 years, Marais built many different cameras, including this model from 1887. Here's the Feral Fount, 1996. Brooklyn-based Gregory Barsamian made kinetic sculptures that animate three-dimensional objects in real time. That's interesting. It's like a bomb falling and it explodes. Oh, viewer discussion is advised. That's so cool. Oh, now that's awesome. Wow. Let me zoom in for the lighting. That's so cool. Charlie Chaplin, Hell's Kitchen. So they, these were mutoscopes, which were flip books.
So here we have an entire history of all the film cameras and TV cameras made throughout all cinema history. For example, number one, wow, dates back all the way to 1908. Number three is 1921, 1925. Wow. And they were already getting pretty small. This is the first practical motion picture camera made possible by the invention of the flexible paper-based film by Etienne Jules Marais in France, 1888. And in 1891, Thomas Edison created the first American camera to use flexible film. Right here, the very first camera, wow. Kind of looks like, like my iPhone with the three lenses and everything. Goes to show to not take for granted our phones, I mean, we used to take all this to make film, but now we can use our phones to make any type of video that we want to. And here is the more common shape that we recognize from the emoji as well. And this was a single system newsreel camera from 1928. And these cameras also had a sound capabilities. So these were to make those, these news reels that you will watch the news basically. Uh, in the movie theater, uh, you can go to movie theaters that were dedicated for news reels and short films, or you watch this before your feature film. And here are the TV cameras. And this is one of the very first color television cameras, 1954. Thank you. Come and check out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nowadays, you can get a light that's like this big, the size of your phone, that's super bright. Probably as bright as these. <laughs> that one's massive. That one's to recreate the sun or the moon light. So here's a very interesting aspect of filmmaking. So. Controlling a sound environment is very difficult and usually, especially in Hollywood movies, either they realize they have to change dialogue to meet rating standards or some type of change in the script or the dialogue, or they find out that the sound quality wasn't actually that good, so they want to re-record it or that clear. So they do ADR, which is Automated Dialogue Replacement, and the actor has to stay here in a booth and re-record the audio over and over and over again to try and get it perfectly in sync. Select a scene. So we're going to select a scene. And we're going to do an old movie, so hopefully I won't get copyright. Toto? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore.
Oh my God. Your character's lines will appear on the large screen. You have two lines to replace. First, you will rehearse, then you will record. So we can get new audio. All right. Rehearse your first line. Speak in a normal tone of voice. After the three beeps, say the line along with your character. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. You will now record your first line. <laughs> Say the line along with your character. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Oh, I think I said out of sync. Rehearse your second line. Oh, that's hard. Oh my god, this is what actors must go through. We must be over the rainbow. You will now record your second line. And the mic is up there. We must be over the rainbow. <laughs> now watch the scene with your voice oh, on the soundtrack. Oh, that's so weird. I'm totally out of sync. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, I'm out of sync. Let me see what the... We must be over the rainbow. <laughs> that was a little bit better. If others are waiting, please give the next person a turn. All right, I have an audience right behind me. That was fun. So these were the editing machines. Nowadays, I do my own editing for a vlog, for any type of video on my phone. <laughs> Actually, the original, the tools they use on your phone, cut, split, um, detach the audio. A lot of those features are actually were originally in these machines, but they were analog. They were mechanical. You were dealing with actual film. So editing wasn't that flexible. You had to be very sure what you wanted to edit. Otherwise you would ruin the film. Here's the old editing equipment, 1928, wow. Here's special effects, Freddy Krueger, the gigantic version from the dreams or the nightmares. One of the spaceships from I think 2001 or, or, or Star Wars. And The Exorcist filmed also here in New York City or at least part of it. Hmm. 
Here's Edison's kinetoscope, late 1800s. And you will watch originally the kinetoscopes through here. But this one's not working. And one of the original televisions, oh my god. These are film cameras with audio as well, so gigantic devices, but the TVs, so small back then, wow, <laughs> like an iPhone's about the same size as this. Now, I remember this one, I used to watch TV in a similar cabinet like this. Okay, let's check out the situation room. Where, do we, where does one go to the situation room? Whoa. Oh, I can't go to negative one. <laughs> so, wow, that was, that's amazing. This is a cool <laughs> elevator. It's so brightly lit. That's cool. Okay, everyone, that it brings us to the end of the exhibition. We saw two floors, lots of cool things to see. Uh, highly recommend coming here. Uh, there is an outdoor space as well uh, with a few seats. And then there is also a screening room and they always show cool old films. Sometimes they show new films if it's like a premiere of a art film, something like that. 
but like today, for example, they're giving me F is for fake. One of the best documentaries, in my opinion, uh, made by Orson Welles, a master. So there's always really cool films here. I've seen, I've seen many films here. I've seen like the old Matrix. Um, I saw the Hateful Eight here as well for a second time. They also do like reruns of movies that were in theaters, but uh, many, many months ago. So really cool exhibition. Highly recommended, $15 right now for people who, uh, in general admission, but there's discounts for uh, professors, for teachers, and for college students, and for students overall. And it does close at 8 p.m. on Fridays, which is really good. It's a nice late night museum experience because not every museum is open that late. I do recommend it. Thank you everyone so much for watching. This was a very long video. And, um, and if you're watching this before it's posted publicly, thank you so much for lending your support. Patreon.com slash urbanist or uh, pressing that join button on YouTube or become a supporter button on Facebook. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye <laughs> from the random one of the screen rooms.